Hello, CCSU. All right, good evening. My name is Henry Myers. I am a senior social work student here at CCSU. As a chairperson for Mosaic, um, the CCSU Student Union Board of Governors, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event. It was our intention to show Ms. Alexander the support to build a movement for education, not incarceration here in CT. This is a historic event in the history of CCSU. So bear with me a little bit. I'm a little nervous for this historic event. So many people, right? Okay. First of all, we'd like to thank President Toro. Her, yeah. her executive committee and the Board of Regents for encouraging CCSU students to produce the large program interventions that complements our classroom learning and engages the community and students of the excuse me of the ac academic of conversations that we will reflect on long after the program is over. We welcome our educational partners that have brought groups tonight from Hustonic Leon, Amherst, Goodwin, and Yukon Law. In addition, we welcome community partners here, the CT and WCP, CT bro uh, Probation, CT Lawmakers, CT Bar, Crawford Bar, the Storehouse members, the CT Center for Nonviolence, and number of faith-based communities in the audience. At this time, I appreciate it if everybody take their cell phones out and actually turns them off for the next 75 minutes. So I'll give you a little bit of time to do that right now. Or on silent. As you may be aware, we have solicited questions from our ticket holders in advance of the program so our moderators could select and incorporate questions into discussion that add value to the limited time we have with Ms. Alexander. Thank you for submission. We apologize that we will not be able to answer all questions that were submitted. It is an honor to have been part of inviting Ms. Alexander to campus. I especially wish to thank CCSU students and faculty who have taken the time to come tonight, especially those uh, faculty members who have their classes here, like mine. We only have about 75 minutes with Mr. Alexander and hope you will consider staying for the duration so that you are not a disturbance to the experience of others in the full house. Without further delay, I would like to invite our moderators Dr. Evelyn Phillips. And Dr. Warren Perry of the CCSU Anthropology Department to take their seats on the stage. You can continue to clap. As a professor of anthropology, Dr. Phillips was selected to moderate tonight's conversation because her teaching philosophy encourages students to reframe learning experiences, observe, pose questions, and analyze situations. Dr. Phillips believes if students are able to critically examine their world, understand context and the interconnectedness of life, then advanced technology, downsizing, and people within the cultural views are not considered major threats 
but opportunities to explore new prospects. Dr. Warren Perry was selected because his research interests include African diasporic studies, African cultures, African archaeology, African American archaeology, archaeology of class formation and social inequality. He teaches courses and conducts research in each of these areas. Dr. Perry currently serves as the Associate Director of Archaeology, Principal Archaeologist for the African Bureau of Ground Project in New York City. I would like to invite Professor of Political Science and former State Representative Bill Dyson to the stage to introduce our guest for the evening. Thank you. Uh, good evening to all. Welcome. Let me, let me just say, um, on an occasion such as this, in which you have so many people who are coming together around an issue that they feel some connection with, and they are all in one place, and in, in one place, and they can see each other, is a way by which you foster discussion, have debate. And there are a lot of people here tonight, you know, that, and I just want everyone here to fully understand that what is taking place is monumental. It is monumental. And I, and I say now for the young people here, especially young people. Because the young people made this possible. They brought the energy to this, and they are here. So I just want to, they, us not to overlook that very fact, that that is what you have here in your midst. And do take the opportunity for somebody you don't know. Make sure you get to know them. Say something, if nothing else but say hi. How you doing? Because we all understand we are here because this issue that Ms. Alexander is going to talk about matters. This issue matters. <laughs> now, and, that, and that is my way of kind of, kind of welcoming you here uh, this evening uh, for this for this, uh, this occasion. Now, you, 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 you have, may not have met uh, Michelle Alexander before, but she is striking in terms of her uh, 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 expression. She is striking in terms of her commitment to an issue. She is striking in terms of being serious about the issue at hand. And she does it with a pleasant expression. <laughs> she does it with a pleasant expression, which means the issue does not have to conjure up fear in anyone, because it's just something you can talk about. And the more we talk about this issue, the more we understand each other the more we learn to appreciate each other. We're not going to do this alone. There, there's no expression I, I use is that uh, none of us go through this world alone. What comes out to the life of others come back into our own. You don't do it by yourself. It's with others that you do this. And I feel good with what I see here tonight for the people who are here. And especially, again, especially for the young people. For the young people. Now, I, let me get on to my, the job I have at hand here. And the job I have at hand is, now that's another lesson I, I thought, I think I got over to you, I hope you did. 
when you get an opportunity to get before an audience, use it. <laughs> use it. Don't ever let it be said that you had an opportunity to be before a large audience and you didn't say what you felt was on your mind. Don't care! You know I'm having fun here now, don't you? <laughs> Thank you. But M Michelle is the person that I'm to introduce here. But, you know, I, and, and I'm supposed to kind of give some comments about why are we here? Well, I think that's self-explanatory in a big way. That we know why we're here because we wouldn't be here if we didn't have that understanding as to what was going to go on there. So I think we know why we're here. And, you, and you're going to hear from Michelle Alexander shortly. But let me tell you something about uh, 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 Michelle. Uh, highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer. And I have this habit in my class to ask young people, what are you going to do with that degree? And there are a number in class who are saying, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. Well, here's a beginning. And note that it can be done because here's someone who has done it. Someone who has done it. So she's a civil rights lawyer, social justice advocate, legal scholar, visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary. She is renowned for delivering insights that pave the way for new perspective on our criminal justice system, the practice of mass incarceration, and the various challenges facing the civil rights community. She's the author of the best-selling book, The New Jim Crow. Michelle draws from her celebrated work as she peels back the curtain on system, systematic racism in the U.S. prison system and initiates frank, open dialogue about race relations and injustice in America. Folk, let's welcome a rock star. Michelle Alexander. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, wonderful to see so many people willing and eager to have this kind of conversation. So thank you all for being here. We have a lot of young people here tonight, some are from the high schools as in addition to the university. So we would like for you to talk a little about mm -hmm. yourself, you know, to share what led you here to this point, your career trajectory, and the people who inspired you, and the, your community, and what it really means that you are sitting here tonight. Well, I certainly would never have predicted when I was in high school, or even when I was in college, that I would one day be writing a book about mass incarceration or anything else. Um, but I had a passion for justice at a fairly early age. You know, I was born into an interracial family. My mom was white, my dad was black, and they married at a time when it was still illegal in many states. And they got married in Chicago at a time when there was a lot of hostility to the idea of uh, a black man and a white woman saying, I do. And my mother was disowned from her family uh, they couldn't find a church uh, that wanted to marry them. Uh, eventually one did, but only after they agreed to attend counseling, uh, you know, to be counseled out of their marriage. 
so, you know, growing up, I had an awareness that kind of the world wasn't ready for me. Uh, <laughs> and that there were severe racial divisions in our country. But my parents believe strongly in the American dream and they believed that better days were coming. And I was raised primarily on the West Coast. Um, and when I went to college at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, I was faced really for the first time. I had experienced discrimination and being called nigger in California. <laughs> But it wasn't until I went to the South for the first time and saw Confederate flags hanging everywhere and saw severe racial discrimination at a time when we had supposedly left those days behind that I started to begin asking questions about what was really going on in this country. And I did an alternative spring break program where students could, instead of going to the beach or taking time off or seeing their families could go and do some kind of social justice project. And I went to Lexington, Mississippi. And a group of us went to Lexington, Mississippi for the purpose of helping out with a voting registration drive. And when we got there, we were informed that Lexington had redrawn its city boundaries to exclude, basically, the black population. And we were going to be living with a black family in balance due which was the name of the area that had been excluded from the white parts of town. And we were going to be helping folks register to vote because they were being turned away by the voting registrar. And I thought, how is this possible? Uh, the Civil Rights Acts have already passed. Uh, how is it that people can't even register to vote at this time? And we toured the school that was there that was literally called the Attendance Center that had, you know, a, a, a roof that was caving in. And I had the sense that there was this huge part of the country that was left behind, that the Civil Rights Movement hadn't come here yet. And so I became active in social justice causes and started doing work volunteering in urban schools and even became a volunteer prison visitor and became active in social justice causes in high school and decided, I mean in college and decided I wanted to go to law school and to do something uh, to make the dream real for those who had been left behind. And in retrospect, I see now that I had a very warped and romantic idea about what the civil rights movement had actually accomplished and really had no idea that outside of the South, a new system of racial and social control had been born again in this country, uh, in urban areas across this country that no one was willing to acknowledge. Um, so I really went to law school because I believed as a nation we were on the right path um, but that we had a long way to go, and I was inspired by Thurgood Marshall and Ella Baker and so many civil rights heroes and wanted to help finish the job. Um, but at that time, I had no idea that our nation had already taken a dramatic U-turn and that a new Jim Crow system was already being born. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome. We're glad to have you here, as you know. I have a question. In your book, you discuss how this young man from Oakland, California, yes. uh, who documented his encounters with the Oakland police, accused you of not caring about him uh, when you learned he was a felon. What shaped your perceptions of those harmed by the criminal justice system prior to that transformative moment? Uh, prior to, oh, uh, to that transformative moment in the newspaper, when you read the newspaper later, and that affirmed what the young man had reported to you. Yeah. Well, let me just share a little bit about that. Sure. Story. <laughs> you know, um, 
When I became the director of the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU, I was well aware that there was racial bias in all of our institutions. I came to the ACLU having worked as an employment discrimination lawyer, representing victims of race and gender discrimination, people who were being denied you know, hiring and promotions in Fortune 500 companies, as well as a wide range of businesses, and I had been involved in a wide range, housing discrimination, litigation, and so I wasn't naive about the fact that unconscious and conscious racial bias permeates all of our institutions in our society. Um, but I thought that the criminal justice system was just one of many institutions infected with racial bias. I did not, when I first started working at the ACLU, fully grasp the magnitude of what was going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had been receiving a large number of complaints from people who believed they'd been stopped and searched by the police for no reason other than race. And as we began investigating these complaints, we realized that they were widespread. And so we set up a hotline number for people to call if they believed they had been stopped or searched on the basis of race. We called it the DWB hotline, the driving <laughs> while black or brown hotline, and we sued the California Highway Patrol for racial profiling in their drug interdiction programs, and we were looking to sue some other police departments as well, including the Oakland Police Department, you know, about which we had received a number of complaints. And so I was spending my day, this one day, uh, interviewing one young black or brown man after another who had called our hotline number to report discrimination by the police. And this young man kind of walked into my office carrying a stack of papers about this thick. He had taken detailed notes of his encounters with the mm -hmm. Oakland Police Department over about a nine month period of time. He had taken notes of every time he had been stopped, every time he had been frisked, mm -hmm. every time he was in a car that had been pulled over and had been searched or that he'd been asked where he was going or what he was doing. He, had names of officers, even badge numbers. He had names and addresses and phone numbers of witnesses, who was with him and who could testify to what happened, uh, if someone was beat up in the encounter or not. Just an unbelievable amount of documentation mm -hmm. and detail of this pattern of police stops that he had been experiencing. And we knew that the Oakland Police Department had been sweeping his neighborhood. and. He was a well-spoken young man, he was good looking, and I thought he's our dream plaintiff. You know, he's the one we've been looking for who could be our named plaintiff in this mm -hmm. class action suit mm -hmm. we were planning to file against the Oakland Police Department. So I'm getting him all excited, asking questions, he's giving me more information, detail, and then he says something that makes me pause. And I said, wait a minute, what did you just say? Did you just say, did you just say you're a felon? Did you just say you're a drug felon? Because when people were calling our hotline number, we actually mm -hmm. sent them a form to fill out, asking them a bunch of questions about the police, and one of them was, have you ever been convicted of a felony? We believed we couldn't possibly represent someone as a named plaintiff in a racial mm -hmm. profiling case if they had been convicted of a felony, because we knew that if we did, law enforcement and the media would be all over us saying, well, of course the police are stopping him. He's a criminal. Mm -hmm. He's a felon. This mm -hmm. isn't about race. This is about the police going after the felons, the criminals. And we knew we couldn't put someone on the stand with a felony record without exposing him to, you know, cross-examination mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, lawyers and turning it into a mini trial about some young man's criminal past and deflecting attention away from mm -hmm. the pattern of police mm -hmm. conduct. So we had been excluded from consideration all those who had felony records. And this young man had not, you know, checked the box. And so I'm looking at him saying, uh, what, what are you saying? You're saying you're, you're a felon? And he gets really quiet and he just looks down at the table and then he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a felon, but let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. The, the police planted drugs on me and they set me up and beat up me and my friend. He starts telling me this whole story about how he was framed and drugs were planted on him and he was beat up and his friend. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't mm -hmm. represent you. And I try to explain why he might feel like that was unfair, but, uh, you know, this is, 
And he keeps trying to give me more details, names of those officers and all that. And then finally he says, look, look, I'm telling you, I, I just took the plea because I was scared of doing the time. I just, I took the plea because they told me if I, if I just plead to this, I, I could just walk out with just mm -hmm. felony probation. I could just walk out. But if I try to fight this thing, I could be looking at five years, 10 years, 15 years or more. I was, I was just scared of doing the time. But I'm telling you, I, I'm innocent. I didn't even do this. And I was like, I am sorry, you know but I, I can't represent you. And then he becomes enraged. And he says, you're no better than the police. You're no better than the police. The minute I tell you I'm a felon, you just stop listening. You can't even hear what I have to say. He says, what's to become of me? You know, he says, do you know that I can't even get a job anywhere because of my felony? He's like, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? He's like, do you realize I, I, I can't even get into public housing because of my drug felony? He's like, I have to sleep in my grandma's basement at night because nowhere else will take me in. He's like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to take care of myself as a man? He's like, I can't even get food stamps. I can't get food because of my drug felony. He says, good luck finding one young black man in my neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet. Mm -hmm. They've gotten to us all already. And with that, he snatched all those notes up and just ripped them into tiny pieces and threw them in the air and walked out of there saying, you're no better than the police. I can't believe I trusted you. Well, several months after that, I opened up the newspaper. And what's on the front page? Well, the Oakland Riders police scandal is broken. Turns out that a gang of police officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planting drugs on suspects, beating folks up, and who's identified as one of the main officers charged with planting drugs on suspects and beating folks up? The officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friend. And it was really only then that the light bulb finally went on for me, and I was like, he's right about me. You know, I'm no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I just stopped listening. You know, I couldn't hear what he had to say. And that was the beginning of me asking myself and others a lot of hard questions. Why was it really that we hadn't been able to find one young black man mm -hmm. in his neighborhood mm -hmm. they hadn't gotten to yet? What, what was really going on? And I also started listening more carefully mm -hmm. to the stories of those cycling in and out of our prison system and doing an enormous amount of research. And what I learned in that process blew my mind. And I realize now that it wasn't so much that I came to law practice or to my work as a civil rights lawyer with a whole bunch of stereotypes that were hard set. It was that I had bought into a narrative about why our nation's prisons were filled with black and brown people. And that narrative was bad schools and broken homes and poverty, the end. It had never dawned on me that this literal war that had been declared mm -hmm. on these mm -hmm. communities was making it virtually impossible for anybody to escape its grasp, and that millions of people were now being swept in to our nation's prisons and jails, um, arrested primarily for nonviolent and drug-related offense, the very sort, same types of crimes that occur with roughly equal frequency mm -hmm. in middle-class communities, white communities, as they do in the hood, swept in, branded criminals and felons, and then stripped of all of the rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement, the right to vote, the right to serve on juries, the right to be free of legal discrimination for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I realize now that, you know, it was really because I had bought into this idea that um, the explosion in our prison population had to do primarily with poverty and educate poor education and broken homes rather than our response 
to poverty and economic collapse and despair. And as a nation, we ended the war on poverty, declared the war on drugs, and birthed a brand new system of racial and social control unlike anything the world has ever seen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The central thesis of your book, The New Jim Crow, is that mass incarceration is really the continuation of the marginalization and discrimination that uh, African people have suffered since captivity mm -hmm. in 1619. Uh, we find it interesting that you quote Ronald Reagan, uh, who suggested that the war on drugs is an aspect of the Southern strategy. Mm -hmm. Why did politicians such as Reagan and Bush and Clinton choose such hard sentencing policies and incarceration rather than other forms of discrimination for blacks and Latinx? Apart from winning an election, what are the underlying purpose of mass incarceration? Well, you know, two big things were going on when the war on drugs and Get Tough movement hit hit the scene. Um, first, there was an enormous backlash against the civil rights movement that was brewing. You know, uh, in the midst of the civil rights movement, segregationists began to realize that they could no longer chant segregation forever. That the tide of public opinion was turning against them and they could no longer use that kind of explicitly racist rhetoric. And instead, they began chanting law and order. And they began depicting civil rights activists started arguing that rising crime rates in inner city communities was linked in some way to the fact that civil rights protesters were violating laws against segregation um, at lunch counters and in buses, and that this attitude of lawlessness was spreading um, across the nation, and that we had to get tough. So law and order was a rallying cry in response to the civil rights movement, and the get tough rhetoric was a way of mobilizing white racial resentment uh, in a explicitly colorblind way. So rather than segregation forever, they could say law and order, let's get tough. And all of that racial resentment and anxiety, all of those fears that were bubbling to the surface in white America as really they were facing a demographic shift Right? They, were, they were facing the, the prospect of this whole population that had been kept inferior and locked in a permanent second class status suddenly competing potentially on equal terms uh, for jobs that they, they viewed as scarce and you know, competing for education and opportunity. And this fear and anxiety uh, provoked a lot of resentment, and this get tough rhetoric mm -hmm. provided a vehicle, much in the same way that the get tough on immigrants rhetoric mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is, has emerged today in response to fears of shifting demographics and fears of the white population losing its ground. And uh, that rhetoric uh, made it easy to call for a war on them. Let's get tough on them. But at the very same moment that that backlash against the civil rights movement occurred, there were rising crime rates uh, in inner city communities. And it's because those communities were suffering from economic com collapse, a literal depression. Mm -hmm. Within a very mm -hmm. short period of time, um, factories that had been located in you know, cities like Hartford and Baltimore and Chicago and Philadelphia, I mean, it used to be that factories would often be located in close proximity to inner city communities, black communities, because they wanted to have easy access to cheap black labor. Mm -hmm. But because of deindustrialization, global capitalism, those factories closed down 
moved overseas in search of a new plantation, cheaper labor. And hundreds of thousands of people in these cities lost their jobs and were trapped in racially segregated communities where work had vanished and disappeared. There's a wonderful book called When Work Disappears by William Julius Wilson that describes this phenomenon. So at the very moment where communities of color were plunged into a literal depression and desperation and despair was taking hold, we could have responded with bailout packages, stimulus packages. We could have responded by investing in education and schools so that the young people trapped in these segregated, now jobless communities would have some hope of making a rough transition you know, from an industrial factory-based society to now a service-based society where you not only needed a high school you know, diploma, but you needed a college degree. Uh, in order mm -hmm. to, but instead mm -hmm. of, instead of investing in education, instead of investing in you know, economic investment and job creation, instead of expanding the war on poverty, we ended it and declared a literal war on the very communities that had been rendered disposable um, by global mm. capitalism and uh, in the midst of this backlash against the civil rights movement, it became very profitable politically um, to call for lock them up and throw away the key. And within a very short period of time, I mean, it's incredible to think how quickly this occurred. Within just a couple of short decades, our nation's prison population 350,000 incarcerated population to well over 2 million, having the highest rate of incarceration in the world. And one of the points I try to get across in the book is that it's not just about who's behind bars. When we talk about mass incarceration, we have to talk about the fact that we have millions more people who are under correctional control, under perpetual surveillance, mm -hmm. on probation and parole, and then tens of millions more people who have acquired criminal records and are thus subject to legal discrimination in virtually every aspect of economic and political life. Um, so when I talk about mass incarceration, I'm not just talking about people who are behind bars. I'm talking about mm -hmm. this vast new system of control, the millions of folks um, who now find themselves relegated to a permanent second class status, permanently locked up or locked out as a result of the wars we've waged on those communities. And their families have also been impacted too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, and this question leads. Yes. This question kind of moves from that uh, very answer that you gave. You said on Fresh Air interview, January 2012, quote, today there are more African Americans under correctional control as you just stated, in prison or jail, on probation, on parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. And that's something that all of us need to be really be thinking about. There are millions of African Americans now cycling in and out of prison and jails or under correctional control. In major U.S. cities today, more than half of the working age African American men are either under correctional control or branded as felons, and thus they're subject to legalized discrimination, as you said, for the rest of their lives. So, when President Trump says that, I hate to say President Trump, uh, says that African Americans, <laughs> says that African Americans, <laughs> says that African Americans have almost full employment. What does that mean to you? How do you see that? That means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, in all seriousness, yeah. um, you know, there was a wave of media attention about this supposed fact that black it's not clear what use this. Uh, I highly recommend if, uh, that people check out a book 
by Becky Pett called uh, Invisible Men, uh, Mass Incarceration mm. and the Myth of Racial Progress. The reason this book is so important is because it talks about the fact that uh, everyone who is behind bars and virtually everyone who is newly released is not counted in poverty statistics, mm -hmm. in unemployment data. Uh, unemployment data reflects only those who respond to surveys about who's currently looking for work. And that unemployment data and that poverty data is so horribly unreliable when describing black experience because it fails to take into account, it renders literally invisible, it erases the millions of people who are incarcerated or cycling in and out of our nation's mm -hmm. jails. Those unemployment surveys uh, count those who are attached to single family homes and respond to phone surveys. So if you are not currently looking for work because you are locked up, if you're not currently looking for work because you have given up on finding work in the legal economy, if you do not have a home because mm -hmm. you are barred from public housing as a result of your felony record, uh, or because you're floating in and out of homeless shelters, or because you're sleeping on relatives' couches, and not responding or receiving uh, surveys regarding your current employment status, you are not counted, you are invisible. And uh, what her research shows is that nearly all of the supposed gains, for example, in reducing uh, disparities in an employment rate, even reducing disparities in high school graduation rates, uh, evaporate when you take into account the incarcerated population and all of those who have been permanently locked out. Uh, you know, in other countries, they make a point of counting not just who is unemployed in the sense of who is currently looking for work, but they make a point of keeping track of who actually has a job. What portion of the population is actually gainfully employed? And that's the statistic that really matters mm -hmm. most, mm -hmm. um, particularly when such a high percentage of our communities uh, have been erased and aren't even counted at all. You answered the second part of my question. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm, the, the, I talk to my students often about the unemployment statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and then there's the statistics about uh, police departments, how many arrested, how many are shot, have no statistics. Right. Uh, so this is very important for us to recognize the invisibility yes. of, these, of our population. Yes, and, and they, there, there are many people who want to keep it invisible oh, and yes. are actively attempting to keep this invisible. You know, when I first started doing racial profiling litigation and work, one of our main demands Mm -hmm. Because back then in the late 1990s, when I first started this kind of work, uh, we were arguing that police officers were engaging in racial profiling and police chiefs would literally say racial profiling is a figment of the black community's imagination. There is no such thing as racial profiling. And they could say it and get away with it because there was no data. That's it. There was no data showing the rates at which African Americans were stopped and searched as compared to whites. And so we began to challenge them by saying, well, if you say it doesn't exist, then collect the data. Mm -hmm. And we started organizing town hall meetings where people would come out and tell their stories of being stopped and searched and their cars tossed and being made to lay down you know, on the pavement or have their backpacks searched while they're on their way to school, telling these stories over and over so that finally they felt enough media pressure with all of these stories to say, okay, we'll collect the data. And then they collect the data and, for example, in the California and Ohio Patrol collected their data, it showed not only were African Americans far more likely to be stopped and searched, uh,
but white people were more likely to be carrying drugs or guns in their vehicles than black people were. Um, and so racial profiling is actually quite unproductive as a law enforcement strategy. Thank you. <laughs> I think it shows you how important it is to ask the right questions. Yes. You know, in terms of research, we can always shape these narratives by the questions that we ask. Mm -hmm. uh, this question kind of deals with Barack Obama, you know, who is often held up as different. Uh, but you discuss how he told a black church before he was elected to the White House that, quote, black men should be better fathers and assume personal responsibility. However, you note that his one-dimensional tirade did not include a contextual understanding of the plight of black men and their families. Why do you think he assumed this position and invoked the stereotypical assumption about black males, given that he's a constitutional lawyer mm -hmm. and surely must have better, been better informed than his diatribe to uh, suggest? Well, he gave that speech at a time when he was on the campaign trail. And, you know, I, I believe Barack Obama was well aware then, as he is now, of the harms of the drug war, drug war. and I would not argue that he was indifferent to it. I, I think, I think he, he cared a great deal about it. But much in the same way that I bought into a narrative, mm -hmm. a, a socially mm -hmm. constructed narrative, about why so many you know, folks of color were cycling in and out of prisons and jails. I think many politicians of all colors have not only bought into that narrative, but have found it easy to sell uh, to audiences. And uh, you know, I'm not sure he would give that speech today. I don't think, I don't think he would. In fact, you know, in the later years of his presidency, uh, he demonstrated that he was you know, very concerned about mass incarceration. I wish he had done far more in his presidency than he did on that issue. Um, I do. Um, you know, I would trade uh, Barack Obama for Donald Trump any day of the week. And, uh, but I, I think we have to look at ourselves as a community and ask ourselves, were we restrained during Obama's presidency? Uh, were we as bold and as vigilant as we should have been um, during his presidency in demanding uh, the kind of change that this crisis really requires? And I don't think the answer is yes. I don't think we can honestly uh, kind of, as communities, look ourselves in the mirror and say, we really went to the mat for our communities during that period of time. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. And, you know, I worry that because we were so consumed with trying to protect, um, you know, a black president who was being unfairly assailed in so many ways um, on the right, that we didn't fight as hard as we could have or should have, um, you know, for the kind of change that was required. And uh, I hope we won't make that mistake again. And I hope that when we find ourselves with black mayors, black governors, black police chiefs, black presidents again, um, that we will you know, view our primary loyalty um, to the communities uh, which are suffering, um, the communities that we claim um, to represent. Uh, and, you know, act with, with more boldness and courage the next time around. Thank you. I, I would just add that there were some like Cornell West who were all over his case and, and continue to be, and I think justifiably so. But uh, to me there's a difference. I just want to say a point on, on that because for me, at least, when I say that we should have acted, or I wish we had um, organized and acted with more courage and more boldness, it wouldn't be to attack Obama. 
No, I agree. But rather to create the political conditions in which it would have been impossible for him not to act. And that, okay. that I think, is, is our job in our democracy. And, you know, very often people will say, oh, well, I need to get into a meeting with the governor if only I, we had access, political access, to this politician or that politician. They say, no, when you have political power, they come to you. Exactly. You know, when you are organized and vocal and active, they will come knocking to you. They will come looking for you, which is what, in fact, happened after Ferguson, right? Mm -hmm. um, when the young people took to the streets in Ferguson and there was an uprising, um, they got invited to the White House. Yes. Um, they didn't have to beg to get in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in many ways, I think the movement for black lives um, is a wonderful illustration um, of the power of young people um, to change the national conversation and to create the kind of political conditions where transformation will change is possible. But we do have to think carefully about how to, you know, transition from pure protest to long-term movement building, um, you know, and strategic change over the long haul. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I have another, I have a question now. <clears throat> you suggest in your book that black communities unwittingly supported the war on drugs. I find this in my own <laughs> discussions with communities. Because they assumed that the police would reduce the crime in their communities. Their call for policing often affirmed the war on drugs. You suggest if these tactics were employed against middle class students, and their communities, the war on drugs would end. How can African Americans empower themselves, coming back to that a bit, against cooperating unwittingly with the police and the war on drugs? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I mentioned before, at, at the time that the drug war and Get Tough movement was gaining steam. There were high rates of crime in many inner city mm -hmm, communities. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to, I think, to underscore that drug crime was not going up when the war on drugs was declared. Drug crime was actually going down um, when President Ronald Reagan officially declared his drug war. Mm -hmm. um, President Reagan officially declared his drug war before, not after, crack hit the streets. Um, so crack became an excuse to escalate a drug mm -hmm. war that had already been declared. Um, but crime rates, you know, had been um, on the rise in these communities. And so it's not surprising yeah. that, you know, black folks faced um, with, with rising crime rates were saying, you know, we need more police. We need some help. Um, but they weren't just asking for more police. They were also asking for better funded schools. They were asking for economic investment. Mm -hmm. They were asking for job creation. Mm -hmm. But all they got were police and prisons. And, you know, I think what happened is that the demands in many communities for more police in a time of crisis, um, those demands were co-opted by a black people supported the mass incarceration of their young people. No, they didn't. Um, black people wanted um, some crime control and for the police to respond to a crisis in their communities. Uh, but because there were voices within the black community that were calling for some get tough measures, uh, they were used mm -hmm. in many ways um, by a larger movement that was happy uh, to provide police and prisons while ending welfare as we know it, ending the war on dr poverty, mm -hmm. um, and investing at a time when so many politicians claimed, well, there's not enough money for more teachers. There's not enough money to fund these schools. At the very time, they're claiming that there's no money for these social programs and job creation. Uh, our nation invested $1 trillion in the drug war alone. 
Um, and so here we are, um, you know, decades later, with millions of people cycling in and out of our prisons and jails, and more than a trillion dollars squandered, um, having done nothing to reduce rates of drug addiction or drug abuse, but to have now produced um, millions of people who are part of a permanent undercast. And what was the role of private prisons in that? Mm -hmm. Well, private prisons, you know, private prisons... As the Get Tough movement gained steam, private interests, corporate interests quickly found out that they could make a killing um, on locking up human beings. And in fact, the private detention centers and private you know, prisons that are being used today to facilitate mass deportation wouldn't even exist today if it hadn't been for the birth of a private prison industry in the era of mass incarceration. Um, you know, private prisons now, you know, are, um, you know, in most states in the United States operating in some capacity. And although uh, the Obama administration indicated that they wanted to phase out private prisons, the Trump administration immediately reversed that decision uh, mm -hmm. when Trump was elected, causing the stock of private prisons to, you know, go through the roof within two weeks after election day. They knew, you know, they were about to cash in again. And, uh, you know, it isn't just private prisons, though, that create a profit uh, motive in mass incarceration. There's a wide range of corporations and private interests that profit from the caging of human beings, uh, including all the construction companies mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. built all of these prisons um, that made a fortune, just like construction companies are hoping to make a fortune building a wall, uh, you know, with, with Mexico. Um, Private healthcare industries, which typically provide, you know, abysmal healthcare behind bars, um, but make a lot of money. Um, private healthcare systems, phone companies that gouge um, prisoners' mm. families mm. Um, have made a killing in this era. So there's a wide range um, of private interests. Uh, taser gun manufacturers, um, you know, the manufacturers of guns and military uh, equipment, since now, you know, military equipment, um, military grade equipment is routinely used by local law enforcement. They have all cashed in um, on mass incarceration as, you know, the birth of this new penal system has actively impoverished um, the people they've aimed to cage. Yeah. So we're here at this university, um, and so we're thinking about what's the role of higher education in the new human rights movement if we are to change mass incarceration. And for example, at our university, uh, criminology is one of the largest majors. Mm -hmm. Uh, but quite a few students of color enroll in that program also. But it appears that many st students and faculty are not necessarily aware of your work. Uh, how must the curriculum change throughout the university, but especially in such fields as social work, criminology, and then law, and social criminal justice? Uh, you know, as I see it, mass incarceration and mass deportation are the most pressing human rights issues mm -hmm. of our time. Mm -hmm. And if in our universities and in our schools we are not teaching the truth about these systems and their history and their birth, um, we, we can hardly call ourselves educational institutions. And, you know, the field of black studies was born because students took it upon themselves to organize and to demand that faculty be hired that would teach them the history they needed to learn. Um, the same is true for women's studies and mm -hmm. queer studies. Mm -hmm. and it, it has often been students who have taken it upon themselves to say, this institution needs to teach us differently to prepare us for the world we're about to enter. And uh, I hope that we'll see that here and in many other uh, universities nationwide.
Again, in your text, you observe that poor whites sometimes experience collateral damage uh, from the war on drugs. However, since 2010, many middle and upper class whites in the United States have experienced the proliferation of opioid addiction. Um, we have seen a shift in the public's perceptions of the uses of opioids. What impact has this shift had on African Americans and Latinx? Well, you know, I, in the book I talk about whites as collateral damage in the war on drugs because the drug war really was aimed with black folks in mind. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, in the early years of the drug war, uh, surveys were done, you know, asking the kind of the general public to close their eyes and to, you know, imagine, you know, a drug criminal and more than 95% of respondents, you know, pictured a black male. Only 5% pictured someone of any other race. You know, so in the public consciousness of war, uh, you know, it was understood, not just by law enforcement, but by the public at large, mm -hmm. that black folks were the enemy in this war. Um, but many white folks did get arrested, not nearly at the same rates. As, as black and brown folks, but many white folks were arrested in the drug war and subject to harsh mandatory minimum sentences. And so I argue they were collateral mm -hmm. damage. They weren't the original target, but they wound up suffering some of the consequences. Um, well, now with the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. which frankly just dwarfs the crack epidemic. I mean, when you look at the numbers of people who are dying as a result yep. of the opioid epidemic, it makes the crack epidemic look like small change. But you will notice that you know, during the last presidential election, I can't recall any presidential candidate lecturing white audiences about how they needed to be better parents or you know, needed to do right by their children. You didn't hear that. Nobody did that. Never. Um, and in fact, most of the public discourse has been about oh, we need a change in strategy. We need to shift to a public health approach. Um, Donald mm -hmm. Trump uh, hasn't quite gotten on with that bandwagon. Um, you know, you may have heard recently that Donald Trump just, you know, said that he wants the death penalty for drug dealers. And that he views, uh, you know, the president of the Philippines, um, mm. Duarte, as Ooh. a model of what an effective drug war looks like. And if you haven't been paying attention to what's going on in the Philippines, they are, the police are mowing down, engaging in extrajudicial killings, just killing suspected drug dealers on the street, willy-nilly. Um, thousands of people have died on the street in um, the Philippines as a result of their drug war. And yet somehow Donald Trump thinks this is a model of what we ought to be doing in the United States and has been calling for um, you know, a get tough mindset. But what's interesting, I think, is that although Donald Trump is banging the drums, um, most local communities are not. Um, most local communities are not eager to revert to the old war on drugs um, as a way of confronting a drug epidemic mm -hmm. that affects mm -hmm. primarily white folks. And, uh, you know, I think it's a welcome change that people are beginning to see what should have been obvious, that drug abuse and drug addiction is a public health problem, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. alcoholism, mm -hmm. that we should not be criminalizing people who are suffering from addiction. I would hope that, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, there's just, um, you know, countries like Portugal, Portugal about 12 years ago, decriminalized the simple possession of all drugs. I mean, all drugs. If you were caught with a small amount of crack, you know, consistent with personal use, not with widespread distribution, uh, you, you were not, you don't have any contact with the criminal justice system. They decriminalized the simple possession of all drugs and they saw a decline in mm -hmm. rates of drug addiction, a decline in rates of drug abuse, a decline in rates of drug-related crime, crime related to addiction, mm -hmm. um, and they achieved that by investing all of the money they had spent locking folks up into drug treatment right. and drug prevention and education. Um, yeah. It's not 
rocket science. Um, and the fact that we as a nation have been so reluctant to do what is so obviously necessary, I think reveals that this drug war was never really about drugs at all. It, it never was. Um, it was declared at a time when drug crime was going down, and it has been waged in a way that makes it far more likely that people who are struggling with drug addiction or drug abuse um, will have a very difficult time ever turning their lives around, much less mm -hmm. um, becoming drug free. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. you began to talk a little about the um, immigration and um, also mass incarceration. So, you th do you think that they are the same political strategy and struggle? In many respects, I mean, clearly, um, the history of African Americans in the United States is unique. And if we go back to slavery, we can see that the very same racial stereotypes that were used to rationalize slavery that you know, African Americans and black men in particular were violent, bestial, had to be made to work, forced to work. Those were the same, those stereotypes were used to justify slavery. Those stereotypes were then trotted out again to justify Jim Crow. And here we go again. It's those very mm -hmm. same stereotypes that are used to justify mass incarceration. Um, but when we, you can't say necessarily that that same continuum, that same history um, applies in the same way um, to the history of mass deportation. But what has been consistent is that conservative, white, racial elites <laughs> who want to preserve their power have consistently throughout history used race to scapegoat, to fear monger, to divide a wedge. And they have done it most typically when they feel that their supremacy in some way is being threatened. Yeah. So on the heels of the civil rights movement, when it looked like this new population was suddenly gonna be competing on equal terms for limited jobs and uh, competing for education on the same terms with them, that fear and anxiety uh, produce resentment and anger that birth the war on drugs and the get tough movement and lock them up and throw away the key. And we can see again that racial anxiety, uh, the fear um, of losing their dominant status in society has led many um, white folks to react uh, out of resentment and anxiety and respond to the kind of scapegoating and fear-mongering um, that we've seen consistently employed throughout history. And it's sad that it can still get such predictable, mm -hmm. reliable results. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my hope that in the months and years to come, there will be more of an effort um, for, the, for the movements to end mass incarceration and the movements to end mass deportation to begin to merge. Mm -hmm. And that we begin mm -hmm. to see you know, that we are all in this together um, and that we connect the dots between similarly, you know, seemingly disparate movements and see this is really about birthing a new America. Um, that we have been in a long, slow, steady process of rebirthing this country and making it a country in which every human being, no matter who you are, you know, where you come from or what you may have done, is treated as though your life matters um, with dignity and respect. Again, this leads me to this question. When you wrote The New Jim Crow, eight years have passed since then, uh, what changes have you observed since 2010? Uh, your book has been highly successful in sparking this conversation, certainly in my own life, for sure. What stage has the dialogue reached? Who are the key players in your estimation? And in what direction is the discussion going? Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, so, no. yeah, so, you know, what I would say is that it, it almost feels like it was a, 
a different world when I was writing the book. <laughs> because, uh, you know, at the time I was working on uh, research and writing the book, our nation was awash in this post-racialism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you know, there was this idea that was so prevalent in kind of mainstream discourse that, you know, we were overcoming. Um, and that the days of white supremacy and racial caste were long gone, that overt bigotry and kind of old Jim Crow type prejudice, that doesn't exist anymore. There may still be unconscious racism, but there's no more conscious racism. Mm -hmm. Those bigots, you know, um, have changed their mind or have passed away. And so in fact, at the time when I was writing my book, um, I was uh, teaching at Stanford Law School, and it's where I had gone to school as a student, and so my colleagues um, were actually my former professors. <laughs> and when I told them I wanted to write my book, they just looked at me and shook their head and said, oh, no, no, you can't write something like that. You know, people are just going to think you're crazy. Uh, no one is going to buy the idea that our criminal justice system functions like a caste system or system of racial control. You know, wait till you get tenure or something, you know, before you write some craziness like that, you know. Um, and so I ended up leaving in part because of that. And I remember when Obama was on the campaign trail, drafting and researching, and I was thinking to myself, oh my God. If Obama is elected president, no one is ever going to believe that something like a caste system still exists in America. And it was extremely difficult when the book first came out. For the first two years, I couldn't get hardly anyone to pay attention. I was speaking to half-empty church basements. I was speaking to anybody who would listen. Um, mm. But then finally, when the novelty of his presidency began to wear off a bit, um, people began to be open to asking some questions about what was still going on. But it was also the case that, you know, Obama was elected in the midst of our economic crisis. Yes. And mm -hmm. many states were facing literal bankruptcy as a result of that economic crisis. And they realized that there was no way that they could continue to maintain this vast prison state they had created without raising taxes on the predominantly white middle class. And so suddenly there was this moment where people across the political spectrum were, for the first time, were asked, saying aloud, well, maybe we've gone too far. Why are we locking up so many people? And suddenly you have Newt Gingrich, who was, you know, formerly a, you know, get tough, true believer, lock him up, lock him up, writing, you know, opinions in the New York Times saying, you know, it's time for us to scale back the war on drugs. And this wasn't because they had suddenly kind of had an awakening mm -hmm. to the dignity and humanity of the lives that had been crushed by the system. It was because suddenly it was no longer in the interest um, of the white majority to maintain this vast prison state. They didn't want to pay the taxes mm -hmm. to maintain it. And so this opening occurred where people were suddenly willing to have this conversation about mass incarceration and reconsider it. Um, and so there has been bipartisan uh, conversation about scaling back our prison system, and there have been reductions in prison populations in, you know, a number of states, including this one, right. um, that That's has right. seen a significant decline um, in recent years. Um, but my concern is that uh, we will reach a plateau or reverse course. Mm -hmm. If we do not commit ourselves fully to building a multiracial, multi-ethnic, um, multi-class mm -hmm. movement led by those people who have been most harmed um, by this system um, that's really geared up for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's easy to scale back the system a little bit and say, okay, well, we reduce yeah. the prison population mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, our job is done. But the reality is that here in the United States, we have lost perspective. This system has become so normalized and naturalized in such a short period of time that we don't realize that no other nation in the world has a prison population like ours. 
Um, what we are doing by locking up such an extraordinarily high percentage of our population and then stripping them of civil and human rights upon release, which again is something that no other Western democracy does, even in a remotely similar fashion to the way that we do here, um, is so immoral and unconscionable that we really have to take it upon ourselves, not just to think about how do we reduce our prison population, but instead, how do we begin to reimagine our justice system as a whole? and to end the system of mass incarceration in its entirety and reinvest all of those billions of dollars that have been spent locking people up um, back into the communities that have been most harmed um, for education, for job creation, for drug treatment, for universal health care, um, mm. rather mm. than um, continuing with this game of just kind of tinkering with the mass incarceration machine. I agree. I spoke earlier about Connecticut um, doing some reform, and one of the things has been ban the box, where mm -hmm. someone uh, seeks a job that they cannot be asked if they're felon. But in the age of the internet, <laughs> uh, will that the internet undermine the power of that law? Yes. Well, you know, I just. I think it's so important to acknowledge that this ban the box movement was founded by, was launched by formerly incarcerated people. Um, it formerly incarcerated people who organized themselves um, to an organization first called All of Us or None mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. began this movement for the restoration of the basic civil and human rights um, of people who've been released from prison. And they've managed to accomplish a great deal in a short period of time, banning the box in a number of states. Many corporations have got on board banning the box on employment applications so that you know, people won't have their application thrown in the trash before even getting a chance to get to the interview. But you're absolutely right that mm -hmm. uh, you know, as technology continues to evolve and it becomes easier and easier to figure out who has a criminal record, whether or not they've checked the box or not, um, that people continue to face real barriers and even getting over that initial stage of filling out an application. Uh, my view is that, again, we need to think bigger and more boldly in this time. And it's not just a matter of banning a box on an application. It's rather, as a nation, I believe, we ought to commit to ensuring that every person has the opportunity to work at a living wage, whether you've done time or you haven't. That every person has the opportunity to do that. Um, there's, there's no reason that we can't do that as a nation. Um, we're an extraordinarily wealthy nation, and there is so much meaningful work that needs to be done in our communities. And rather than investing our money in building prisons and cages and all of the money that goes into surveillance, why not invest that money by paying people to fix the roads and to paint their schools and to work as teachers and to serve as uh, youth leaders and counselors? Uh, we could put everyone to work in this nation if we chose to do so. Um, but we haven't. And uh, we can see where our priorities have been um, by the actions we've chosen to take instead. Yes. Uh, as we were speaking earlier before we come, and this is not the question, but that, to my mind, we'll be back to this, right, has uh, a lot to do with the type of system this is and the history of this system and how it operates on profit and not people. That is crucial for all of us to understand. That's absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. You know, more and more, um, I have been urging people to think beyond just fixing our justice system, <laughs> because I don't, I don't think we can fix our justice system without reimagining our democracy, without reimagining our economic system. You know, this two-party pay-to-play political system that we have is not designed for poor people. It is not designed to serve poor people or 
even working class folks, um, a system in which politicians can be bought, essentially, by the highest bidder, mm -hmm. is never going to be responsive um, to poor communities and to communities of color. And so if we're serious about ending mass incarceration, we have to think about, well, what kind of political system would make it possible for poor people to have a voice? And uh, just going to the, the polls and casting your vote among candidates that have been pre-selected um, by parties that are awash in corporate cash uh, is not a system <laughs> that is going to make it possible um, for poor people to realize their future. Um, and the same is true with our current economic system. You know, when you ask questions about global capitalism and ask questions about capitalism, people get afraid of being labeled a socialist. Why are you, are you a socialist? Are you saying you're a socialist? You know, there are much worse things a person could be called. <laughs> there really are. And I, for one, am, am not afraid of the word. I'm not afraid of it. You know, you, you look at other Western democracies, like Norway, supposedly Trump's favorite country, Norway. <laughs> which, you know, is considered a socialist democracy, it has universal health care, high quality education, free college, all of these things, which Trump apparently abhors in the United States, but he's hoping that we'll get some more Norwegian immigrants. Um, and, and I think that we have to relax our fear um, of being called a socialist or being anti-capitalist. Um, Norway itself was actually rated, I think, in Forbes magazine as the best place for business, or one of the top five in the world. Um, and no doubt, a big part of the reason why Norway does well um, is because its people are very well cared for. And we in this nation have a lot to learn about what it means to really care for one another. And the fact that we mm. don't have a health care system that affords quality health care to every human being as a matter of a basic human right um, is part of the reason why we have higher rates of drug addiction and drug abuse. Um, and so I hope that we will um, be willing in the months and years to come um, to ask harder questions about our political system and our economic system and dare to dream that we can actually birth something different here. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> We're down to the last question. We've been given a two-minute warning. Uh, and this question really feels more in a personal uh, um, issue. You know, you were doing all this work. You're dealing with the stark reality mm -hmm. of our world and mass incarceration. How do you maintain your well-being while, you know, doing this work? Um, <laughs> And so it's not soul killing. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'd have to say that I think that the system in many ways can be spirit murdering, but generally when we join together um, to, to, to fight for the freedom of those who've been locked up and locked out, that that's that's soul filling, mm -hmm. you know. That isn't that isn't the spirit murdering part of it. Um, it can get very depressing um, and discouraging and exhausting. <laughs> and there have been times when I've crashed and burned. And no doubt, there's many people in this room <laughs> and have been through it themselves. Um, and I hope that just as we learn to kind of care for one another as a nation better that we'll learn to care for one another in our communities better so that we uh, have the stamina that it will take to build the kind of really revolutionary movement that this country needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Wow. That was, that was awesome. Awesome. CCS, you give another hand. Give another hand. So on behalf of Mosaic, um, we'd like to thank Michelle Alexander for coming here this evening. Um, we also would like to thank Dr. Warren Perry, Dr. Phillips. Um, This was, this was definitely a moment in history. Um, I hope that we continue as a community to have these conversations. Um, this was just the beginning, I hope, and that we can continue to do this. Um, it's something that definitely needs to be talked about, and I encourage everyone to do so. i also like to thank uh, Professor Dyson up here to, for introducing me to the book of the new Jim Crow. All right. So I'm, I'm going to give it to him. He's going to make a last comment. Um, what I'd like to do is to thank all of you for coming, and um, as a follow-up to this, on tomorrow, there's a forum being held here at Central um, in the Student Center. This is the 15th anniversary of our having this forum, by which the very issues that Michelle Alexander has talked about, we're going to engage in workshops tomorrow dealing with these very issues. So for any of you who are around would like to be a part of that, just know that we'll be in the Student Center tomorrow, and I think we're starting at 9 o'clock, and we'd love all of you to attend. Secondly, I'd like to say to you here this evening, young people, and I'm going to hop on it until I take my last breath, young people make the difference because they bring the energy. Young people. Thank you.